Hi, today in Applied Calculus we're going to learn about related rates. So we just learned about the chain rule and then implicit differentiation and related rates is really like implicit differentiation on steroids. So when we did implicit differentiation, whenever we got to y, since y was a function of x, we had to remember to multiply by dy dx or y prime, its derivative. Well in related rates, this time every variable is going to be changing with respect to another variable, usually time for a real world situation. So every time we get to a variable, whether that be volume or radius or height, we're going to need to remember the chain rule that that really changes over time and to multiply by d variable dt, that derivative of the inside. So for example, if I have a conical tank or one of those terrible paper cone cups that you might put water in at a doctor's office or something like that that's leaking out the bottom or a snow cone cup that's leaking out the bottom and going down. As time elapses, not only is the volume obviously changing because you're losing the liquid, but as that's happening, the water level is going down and so that height is decreasing and also as you go down in a cone, the radius is going to get smaller and smaller. So if I now have this much water, then my height only goes this far and my radius only goes that far. And so radius, height, and volume are all changing with respect to time. And so all of them, when we try to take their derivative or talk about a rate of change, we will need to multiply by that derivative of the inside. So I don't want you stressing about formulas unless it's something really easy like area of a circle, maybe the Pythagorean theorem. Um, if it's anything more complicated than that, I will definitely provide it for you. So for instance, this volume of a cone, um, it is one-third pi r squared h. If you have a homework problem with a more complicated one and it's not provided in the homework problem, you are welcome to ask Siri or ask Google, okay, because I will give it to you on the test. So if we have this, um, relating what the story is happening, what's draining out of that cone, this is the volume of a cone, what we need to do is differentiate implicitly, as we have discussed before, um, both sides. But we have to remember that V, R, and H are all changing with respect to time. And so it's going to be that chain rule action going on. So what is the derivative of V with respect to T? It's dv dt, so we're done there. On the right hand side, we need to think about what are constants and what are variables that are changing with respect to time. One third and pi are constants. And then we need to take the derivative of the part with variables that do change with respect to time. Now, something else we're gonna have to be on the lookout for is that while these are different variables, r and h both change over time, both are functions of t, and so this is actually a product rule problem. So we're going to need to implement the product rule when we take that derivative. So we have first r squared times the derivative of h is dh dt plus the second h times the derivative of the first. So for that derivative of r squared, we take the derivative as usual, 2r, and then we remember that um, chain rule that r is actually some function of t, even though we don't know what it is. And so we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside dr dt. So it's just like when we saw y's before, but it's for every single variable we encounter. So we're going to um, actually see what the rest of a problem would look like and use this formula on the next page. So with this scenario, you might have a problem that says, suppose that the height is changing at a rate of, that's a derivative word right there, negative 0.2 feet per minute, and the radius is changing at a rate of negative 0.1 feet per minute. Now, these could have been worded decreasing at a rate of, and then just had 0.2 feet per minute, and that word decreasing would indicate the negative sign. So we will see that. We'll need to be careful about that. 
What is, question words tell us what we're trying to solve for. Again, rate of change, some derivative is what we're trying to solve for um, in the volume when the radius is r equals 1. So remember, as time elapses, volume is um, decreasing, the water is coming out of the cone. And so what we're finding is a derivative at a certain instant, right? Instantaneous rate of change derivative. So they have to tell us what instant. At that instant, when the radius is 1, what is the rate of change of volume? Because that might be different than the instant when the radius is 2 or a half. Okay, so what we want to do is read through and identify what we know, what we don't know, and so are solving for. And why is this called related rates? There's going to be some equation that relates um, the information that you're given. Okay, so for this problem, um, we already had the formula that related the quantities, and that was the volume of a cone, and we already did our derivative of that. I do think that sometimes um, it is nice to actually do the derivative part first because then you know what names to give variables. This particular problem already was using R's and H's and had a picture labeled with R's and H's, so it wasn't as much of a problem. So as we read through this, it says, suppose that the height is changing at a rate of, that's a derivative. A derivative of what? Height. Height is what's changing. So we have dh dt is, and we need to remember the negative sign, even if it had said decreasing at a rate of. Then we keep reading. And the radius is changing at a rate of, that's a derivative. A derivative of what? Radius. dr dt negative 0.1 feet per minute. It makes sense that these have a per in them because they are a rate of change, right? We'll always have a per in the units of a rate of change. And then question words, what is the rate of change of volume? So that's what I don't know. That's what I'm trying to solve for when the radius is one foot and the height is two feet. So these are not constants for the whole problem. They're constants for this instant. And we will talk about the difference between those. So we would read through the problem, state our um, knowns and unknowns. If we hadn't already talked about it, get our equation. And then we would differentiate that equation and then just plug in the pieces. But I want you to think maybe before you even plug in, what do you expect this answer to be? Do you expect this answer to be positive or negative? What we're trying to find is the rate of change of volume. Well, what's happening to volume? Volume, it's, it's decreasing, right? The volume is decreasing as the water drains out the bottom. And so I expect this to be negative. And that will help me catch errors like failing to realize that a word decreasing meant these were negative. You don't want to just shove a negative on the end. You want your work to actually reflect that so I can give you credit for that. So now we're just going to plug in the pieces. And our r was 1. dh dt was negative 0.2. And then we had 2r. h was 2. And dh dt was negative 0.2. Oh, wait, let's see. dr dt is negative 0.1. And so then you're just evaluating this. And uh, we can talk about you know, exact. A lot of times I ask you to leave your answers as exact. Uh, but usually in these real world problems, we're going to kind of wrap our heads around what the number actually is. And so we usually do want a decimal. Um, and this should work out to, I think, negative 0.6, 28. And, and it probably continues. Um, so depending how the question asks you to round, if I look at the rest of the question, it was going to one decimal place, so I'll probably do the same. And then you should expect to be able to write a conclusion about these problems with actual words, okay, a sentence. And so what we have determined, it says, what is the rate of change of volume? So we have realized that volume is decreasing because of the negative sign at a rate of .6. And then what would our units be? We have to be careful here. What are units of volume? Well, we know that the height and the radius were being measured in feet. 
volume then would be feet cubed, okay? So you may not have actually seen feet cubed anywhere on here, but if your base measurement is feet, then you need to know that volume would be feet cubed. And then per units of the input, time, which is minute. So we have volume is decreasing at a rate of 0.6 feet, cubic feet per minute. If you are just asked to state what DVDT is, then you would write negative 0.6. If you're summarizing, then the word decreasing indicates that negative sum. So our steps are to read through the problem carefully. If there isn't a diagram provided, we might want to do that. We might need to draw a diagram. And then <clears throat> you need to go through the knowns and the unknowns, and you also need to write an equation that relates the various quantities. That's why it's called related rates. Again, I sometimes think it's better to write the equation first so you know what letters you might use when you're identifying what you do know. Um, and then the biggest thing is that this is the chain rule. This is implicit differentiation, just a little bit harder core. So remember that every time you get to one of these variables that's changing with respect to your input variable, usually time, you need the chain rule. And then you're going to plug in the given information and solve for the unknown information. So just to show you, sometimes when we're reading these problems, we have to think a little bit to assign variables. So this says the velocity of a car after traveling for one hour is 50 miles per hour. Well, velocity is a rate of change, and I know that partly from the units, the per. So we have miles per hour. And so when we think about this, velocity needs to be d something dt because it's a derivative. So d what dt? And so that's how we realize that actually the other variable besides the t, the time that we obviously need, has to be a distance which is measured in miles. So it does take a little bit of analyzing, and it really does go back to those units. So for a problem like this, we might need to say x or whatever variable, d is probably a bad choice because you already have lots of d's floating around, um, is the distance traveled. And uh, we actually know that's in miles. And that all came from the units here. And then our time is our input, and we were told it was in hours. And then now that's a rate of change, dx dt, and that's why we have miles per hour is 50, and we're trying to find it when the time is one hour. So this is not a whole problem. This is a part of one. But to show you, they're not always going to explicitly you know, have this outline, but it's all there with the miles and the hours that actually tells it to you. Similarly, when we have volume problems, you don't always see the word like the volume is increasing. So this is water is being pumped into a swimming pool, or air is being pumped into a balloon. Well, OK, that's how we speak, but what's actually happening? Well, if that's happening, the volume of the swimming pool is going up, or the volume of air in the balloon. But that isn't really how we speak. So we have to be able to translate that. So when you read this, think what is actually happening. It's volume that's changing. Another way to do that is look at the units. It's cubic meters right, meters cubed would be volume, and then per hour. So I know my input variable t must be in time, and that the output variable that I'm talking about here is volume, and then that's how I would pick out my variables to set up. So v is the volume of the water in the swimming pool, and I now know that it's in meters. It's not meters cubed, right, volume is meter cubed, so the base one should just be regular meters. And I know t is time in hours because of the units, and then they told me, you know, dvdt is 10 cubic meters per hour. Again, there'd have to be more to this, and you would actually be solving for something, but the setup is usually the most daunting part for word problems, so just a little bit of warm up there. Okay, so here's what a real problem will look like from scratch. So this says a pebble was dropped in the water and made ripples, and so it makes circular ripples that go out, and um, the radius r of the outer ripple is increasing at a constant rate, okay? So that's talking about this radius that goes out to the edge. Um, and so I have increasing at a constant rate of one foot per second. And it, so it's a rate of change. And then when the radius is four feet, what is? the um, rate that the total area is changing. So as we read, we were told the rate of change of radius. The units also tell me that it was a rate of change of radius.
We also were told the instant that we're going to look into, which is that the radius is 4 feet. The unknown is the question words, right? At what rate is the total area um, changing? So I see rate of change. So what I don't know is the ADT. So there, you know, we almost always use R for radius. We almost always use A for area. So that may not have been hard for you to come up with. But remember that also, we could think of the equation first, and then we'd know what letters we typically use. So what is being talked about, what equation relates the quantities, it's just the area of a circle, which is A equals pi r squared. Okay, So if you actually thought of that first, then you would know, oh, I should use A for my output and R for radius, and then they're changing over time as usual for T. So again, think ahead. This is the rate that the total area of the disturbed water is changing, that ripple is going out, the, the radius is increasing, um, and so therefore the area is increasing. So I should expect a positive answer, right? But again, that'll help me kind of check for errors at the end. So once I've listed my knowns and my unknowns, I take the derivative implicitly of both sides, remembering that every variable changes with respect to time. So I just do DDT of each side. Well, that is the ADT on that side. And on this side, I need to keep in mind pi is a constant and then take the derivative of R implicitly. So the pi is a constant that stays. The derivative of R squared is 2R, then times the derivative of the inside because R changes with respect to time, dr dt. The other thing I want to be careful about um, Especially if this problem were asking me for dr dt, if you don't have anything to solve for, you probably messed up, right? So the most common mistake is to forget to multiply by this. But I actually have a number to plug into this. Or in another situation, I'd be solving for that. I have to have something to solve for. So here, I need somewhere to plug this in. And that can help remind you that you need to remember that implicit differentiation. So I don't know dA dt. I do know r. I do know dr dt. I plug in and I solve. Okay, so I just replaced R with what we knew it was. I replaced um, dr dt with what I know it was, and then I can evaluate. So it's 8 pi, and we need to think about the units, and we could get an estimate of it. Do I have an estimate? I, I don't have the estimate, but you could type it in to get the approximation. And what should the units be? Well, our base units were feet, so area would be square feet. And then um, we see here that our time must have been measured in seconds. So the units really tell you about other units. So the ADT is positive as expected, and it is 8 pi or whatever that is approximately, you can find out, um, square feet per second. So what we would say is that area is increasing at a rate of. eight pi feet squared per second, okay? So if you're just asked to type it in, you can do this, but you do need to think about your units. Um, but if you, but you, could, you should expect to write a sentence summarizing it as well, especially on the test. All right, so we've got two more to look at um, so that we can get in the habit of these not knowns, unknowns, and the equation. So this one is an example like the swimming pool problem. It says air is being pumped into a spherical um, balloon and then tells us some information. So if you need to model it, you can. But I'm going to have some sort of radius. And again, um, it's talking about the volume of a sphere, even though most of our balloons are not perfectly sphere, but they exist. Um, and so I would give you this equation, the equation relating it. And that is 4 thirds pi r squared, pi r cubed. All right, and then now that I have that, I know I'm dealing with V's and R's as I go forward. So I read through the problem. The air is being pumped in at a rate. That's the volume changing of 4.5 cubic feet per minute. This also tells me that that is volume I'm talking about because it's cubic feet. Okay, and then it says find the question words, 
rate of change of radius when the radius is two feet. So that's what I don't know. And I'm trying to find it at the instant when radius is two. Okay, so next I would differentiate both sides with respect to t. So dv dt on the left, on the right, 4 thirds and pi are constants that stay. And then the derivative of r cubed would be 3r squared dr dt. So this one is a great example. We are not always going to be just plugging in on the right and spitting out on the left. And again, if you never wrote dr dt because you forgot implicit, which is kind of the whole point of this, um, you would not have anything to solve for when I go to plug in. So I'm going to plug in what I know, solve for what I don't know. Okay, so I was told the 4.5, I was told the 2. Again, if you had forgotten that, this is what students will have on their paper. And I'll write, what are you solving for? There's no unknown and it's a false statement. Those two sides don't equal. So let, let that common math sense come in um, and say, I must have forgotten something. Oh yeah, the thing I'm solving for, dr dt, it has to be there for you to get it by itself. And then we would uh, work it out. So it turns out the threes cancel, just happens. Um, and then we can divide and then we can get the approximation. Do I have it? It is about 0 0.0895 and then I can just put units on it. So let's think about the units. This is dr dt. So if volume is in cubic feet, then radius is in feet. And it's a rate of change and it's changing with respect to time, which was in minutes. And so here we got a positive. Now we forgot to do our little check ahead of time, but we got a positive and that should make sense because we are blowing up the balloon. And so as the volume increases, so does the radius. And if it's increasing, then it's a positive value. So we could say the radius is increasing at a rate of 0 0.0895 feet per minute. Okay, so this time we're gonna see a different formula. So we've seen different formulas each time. And this is talking about a ladder leaning up against a wall. And it says the bottom of the ladder is moving away. And, and so the ladder's sliding down. So the bottom moves away, the top moves down, and then the ladder would end up falling, right? And it's 26 feet. And you could pick whatever variables you want. But the second you think about this, a ladder against a wall, what shape did it make? It made a triangle. If specifically, I hope your walls are straight, it made a right triangle. So if you remember the Pythagorean theorem, you might have remembered it as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You're welcome to use those variables here. Um, I chose to use x and y, so I remember that I'm defining x as horizontal and y as vertical, just like on a plane, but you can do whatever you would like. Okay, so with my variables, x squared plus y squared equals 26 squared. So you might say, okay, we hadn't been plugging numbers until later, and in general, we do not want to plug numbers like this three feet per second in before we take a derivative or we'll have all constants and derivatives of constants are zero. So that won't work out. But what we want to distinguish between is a difference between them telling me find this rate of change at the moment when r equals one versus the moment when r equals two or so on and a global constant, a constant that is there for the entire problem. This is not one of these collapsible ladders. This is a good old wooden ladder. It is 26 feet and it is always 26 feet. And as it falls, it's not shattering, it's not shrinking, it will still be 26 feet. So when you have something that is truly constant for the entirety of the problem, then you do want to put it in from the beginning and its derivative really is zero, okay? So if we read through now that we know some variables, the bottom is moving away at three feet per second. That means this quantity is increasing, that's gonna be a positive number. Okay, then it says the top is moving down. 
that means height uh, up against the wall is decreasing. That should be a negative. And that is, um, I don't know that, okay? But it might be good to go ahead and note that I expect it to be negative. And then it says when, at the moment when, this is a constant just for this moment, not for the whole problem, the ladder is 24 feet um, above the ground. That's your Y. Okay, so any rate of change is going to be a d something dt. That's how I knew to make this dx dt. So I need to take my derivative, um, and then I'll be able to plug things in. Remembering that chain rule, that implicit differentiation every time. So the derivative of x squared is 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt, and then the derivative of a constant is 0. But when we get here and we look at what we know and we look at what we don't know, we're going to see that there are too many unknowns, okay? So we know y, we know dx dt, we want to know dy dt, but we're not going to be able to do that unless we also know x. So it's not a trick question, there's just a little bit more work to be done. So if you go to plug in and you realize there's too many unknowns, then let's think what we do know. Well, at this instant, y is 24. So I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem once as my actual derivative, um, my related rates, and once just a regular Pythagorean theorem to solve for that x. Okay, so I'm just using regular Pythagorean theorem. Um, and as I work this out, I will find that x is 10. Now, I don't have any, too many unknowns. So this is the order I would do things in. I don't like when books magically suggest you do this first because it's like, why? why? How would I know I need to do that? Well, do what we have been doing. Knowns, unknowns, equation, take the derivative, try to plug in. When you try to plug in, you can't. There's too many unknowns floating around. That's why. And it's not a trick question, so there must be some way, and that way is to go back to the regular Pythagorean theorem. So I'd like you to know why you're doing things, not just I better memorize that that happens. So now we have 10. Okay, so now when I plug in, I have one equation with one unknown, and that I will be able to solve. So I can move <laughs> that 60 to the right, and then I have the 48 on the left, and I'll divide. Notice when I move that 60, it's now negative, which is cool because I'm expecting a negative answer. All right, so we have negative 5 fourths, and it's dy dt. y was a height, so it's measured in feet. Time was in seconds, right? So I can go back to other units to tell me the units. So this says at what rate? Again, I would either type negative 5 fourths feet per second, or I would say the, radi or the height. Um, the top is moving down. I guess here the word down would be your negative. Um, so if it says at what rate is it moving down, then that is your negative word and you could say five fourths feet per second. But think about how the words take care of the negative when you're actually summarizing it in a sentence. Okay, so the last one we're going to do is a business related problem. They are actually easier, but for some reason it's the variable x that throws everybody for a loop. We've been used to x being our input. Um, they're not trying to trick you by having x be the input here, but that it's actually changing with respect to time. When we've done profit and revenue and cost, we've always had x as our input, but the reality is that those things could change over time. And so here, the production x, how many things you produce, is changing by week. Like this could be because you have more employees one week than another. Like everybody takes vacation one week, so your production level goes down. So it's realistic. And um, yes, we're used to x, like in implicit differentiation, that x's were fine, but y's, you had to do dy, dx. Well, here, I just need to be careful that my true input variable is time, and x um, is that intermediate variable, and then the c and the r. So the, the actual derivative taking ends up being a lot easier, because they gave us the equation. It's not some crazy geometry formula. But I think it just bothers people that it's x's, but we actually need to think about the derivative with respect to time. 
So um, we have flash drives um, being produced, and the production output is changing weekly. And this X is how many flash drives they produce that week. And then that then affects, of course, their costs and revenue and eventually profits. So it says if production is increasing at a rate of 500 flash drives, well, production was X. So we have DX, DT is that 500 um, drives per week, okay? When production is 6,000 flash drives, that means that X is. And just check your notes. I honestly can't remember if you're, say, 2,000 or 6,000, so just fix it to match mine. All right, so we are given a DX, DT, and an X, and we are asked to find rate of change, and I like change better because it actually might be a decrease, um, of these, okay? So I already set it up. All you're doing is implicit differentiation on each side, remembering that it is DDT and that X is actually a function of T. Okay, so we're going to take the derivative on the left-hand side. That's DC, DT. And on the right side, the derivative of a constant is zero. And the derivative of 2X would be 2, but then I have to multiply by DX, DT. So I have given these before on assessments, and um, it's actually meant to be easy because it's one of the simplest functions I could give you, but it bothers students that there's no place to plug in x. So if there's no place to plug in x, you don't plug in x. It's just like if I ask you, you know, to tell me what y is in the function y equals 5 when x is 2. If there's nowhere to plug x equals 2 in, then y is just 5. So don't let that turn you around. That's going to happen with some of these um, cost functions. So if I only have a dx dt, I only plug in a dx dt. And dx dt was 500. OK, so I have that the cost, right? It's a positive number. So cost is increasing at a rate of $1,000, because it's cost, um, per week, because this was with respect to time, all right? So this is, oops, <laughs> all right, so we have $1,000 per week and it is increasing. Then we would come over here for revenue, same thing. What is the derivative with respect to T of R of X? It's dr dt. And then I take derivatives as usual, except X is a function of T, so I always have to multiply by dx dt. So this one will have X's and dx dt's floating around. And so everywhere I have a dx dt, I'm going to plug in 500. Everywhere I have an x, I'm going to plug in 6,000. And then I just evaluate. And so that should turn out to be negative 1,000. So what we would say there is that revenue is decreasing at a rate of $1,000 per week. Now with profit, um, you, if, if you were just asked for profit, if you were given this and the only problem you were asked was for profit, most likely what I would do in that case is do regular revenue minus cost first and simplify that and then do the derivative implicitly like we did here and then plug in. Um, but if you are building on previous work, then remember if um, profit is revenue minus cost, then even when you take their derivatives, that relationship still holds. So you, if you want um, the derivative of P with respect to time, you can just take the derivative of R with respect to time and subtract the derivative of C with respect to time. And we already found those values. So if we did that, we'd have negative 1,000 minus 1,000, and we would get negative 2,000. So um, just keep in mind, either way is fine. A lot of times I show this way, and students ask why I would do that extra work when all I had to do was subtract. And again, it's just to give you an idea of if I only ask you one of these and it's profit, and you were starting from scratch, that's the more natural thing to do. But sure, if you already have the work, feel free to use it. So you can expect to do a related rates problem, um, both that involve geometry, but don't worry too much about formulas because I will provide them, and one um, pertaining to business since many of our applications we cover in this class are business. So here's an example of a business one. Be careful. It is with respect to time. So yes, even when you get to an X, you have to do that chain rule DXDT. Um, and then a formula, some sort of area, volume, something like that. 
and the formula is given, so you just have to take your derivatives and plug in the right pieces and solve for what you don't know. And we do see that um, the units end up telling us a lot here and that a rate of change will always have a units with a per in it and then we would know um, what our units of our output and our units of our input are. So this does take practice. Um, the setup is usually the problem. Then once you have that, it's the plugging in, you know, goes easier. Um, but do make sure you put in practice and ask me questions early so that I can help you. And then that's going to be it until we move on to curve sketching.